Um, welcome to our KCART research seminar, the first one of the semester. Um, I am Shannon Kelly. I'm the lucky grad student that gets to coordinate these this semester. Um, so I'll be the one sending out all of the emails. Um, we have five talks scheduled for the semester. Um, so this is our first one with Dr. Lauren Etheridge. Um, our next one will be October 1st with Dr. Olivia Veach. And then October 22nd, we have Dr. Lauren Tomey. Um, on November 11th, we have actually me, I'll be talking that day. And then our last one will be November 19th with Dr. Um, Nicole Zieber. And all these talks will be at four o'clock, just like today. Um, I will send out individual um, Outlook invites and emails with the Zoom links before each talk. Um, but we are actually going to, I'm planning on using the same Zoom link for the semester so you can continue to use the one that you're using today. Um, and you all, if you have questions during the talk, um, you all are welcome to send them in the chat. They'll go directly to me and then I can pose them to Dr. Etheridge at the end. Um, or if you all um, want to save them for the end, you can then um, unmute yourself and ask her yourself. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass off to Dr. Moscone, who will introduce our speaker today. All right, thank you, Shannon. Um, real quick, before I even um, begin to, to introduce our, our speaker, um, I did want to just comment that the, uh, the speaker list for this semester uh, is quite exciting just in terms of the diversity of topics that will be covered. Um, so as you may recognize from the uh, speaker names, if you're familiar with them, um, we will be covering things from molecular and genetic uh, genomic analyses related to autism and other developmental disorders as well as um, clinical characterization um, and behavioral intervention. And then we also have uh, talks that I believe will focus um, from infancy to, um, to elderly adults. So um, spanning the lifespan, um, as well as multiple methodologies and levels of analysis. So please join us and please pass those, um, uh, those informational flyers and emails along to colleagues who may be interested. Um, we, we are looking to increase our group as opposed to decrease, so uh, please do share that information. Uh, transitioning over to today's talk, um, it's actually uh, exciting for me selfishly to, uh, to welcome and, and get to introduce um, a friend and colleague, Lauren Etheridge from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Uh, where she's an assistant professor uh, in pediatrics as well as an assistant professor in psychology at the University of Oklahoma. Um, Dr. Etheridge completed her doctoral training in neuroscience at the University of Georgia, where she actually also got her undergraduate degree. Um, and that training was focused really on um, learning about neurophysiology and, and systems neuroscience methods uh, in the context of studies of schizophrenia and, and bipolar disorder. Um, or other uh, adult disorders, primarily adult disorders of, of psychosis. Um, and, and Dr. Etheridge was part of major studies um, within that line of work, but then transitioned more to neurodevelopmental disorders during her postdoctoral training at the University of Texas Southwestern uh, Medical School. Um, her work has, has focused on using um, EG as well as other uh, systems neuroscience methods to understand brain development in, in multiple uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, including Fragile X syndrome, Phelan McDermott syndrome, Tourette syndrome, idiopathic autism. Um, Lauren, you can correct me if I missed any, um, but, uh, but really it, her research is, is quite unique in, in, the, in the sense that um, Lauren, I can attest to, is a very, is a methodologist in the sense that she has really in-depth knowledge of, of the different uh, complex uh, methodologies that she applies, as well as um, in-depth knowledge of the clinical presentation and characterization and development of the population she studies. So it's really a unique synthesis of, 
of, a, of ex expertise that drives her research. She's also part of multiple major studies um, in these populations that are multi-site studies doing careful physiologic characterization as well as testing of new treatment uh, and, and treatment outcomes. So very important work within the Fragile X and autism realms especially. So um, I'm delighted that Lauren was able to join us um, and, and kick off our seminar series for the, the semester. And so Lauren, I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks Matt. Um, and, and thanks for inviting me. This is, is a lot of fun. Um, I love to talk about my work and, and I'm really glad that, uh, that somebody wants to listen. Um, so, so I'm gonna talk today a little bit about neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, particularly, I'm gonna focus on Fragile X syndrome um, and, and give you a little bit of a um, compare and contrast with, with some of our work with um, idiopathic autism as well as um, some other rare genetic disorders associated with autism like Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, and, and really, you know, a lot of my work has been in adults, um, but always with that neurodevelopmental focus, always thinking about how we can uh, apply this towards, um, you know, looking at children and, and, and thinking about how things uh, change over the lifespan. Um, most of my work is in sensory processing um, for a number of reasons that I'll, I'll get into in this talk. So we're mostly going to be talking about sensory processing uh, as measured through EEG, um, electroencephalography, in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders today with a focus on uh, development. Um, so I want to start off with a couple of pictures. I always like to start off with a couple of pictures. I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with what EEG looks like. Um, but I always like to start off um, highlighting the flexibility of the technology from a translational aspect. Um, so my work focuses on EEG because it's accessible to a majority of populations, um, which includes infants and individuals with behavioral and intellectual disabilities. Um, it can be translated directly to rodent models from mechanistic work via mouse EEG. So um, we've got our two pictures here. This is actually, this is my daughter um, when she was two months old. Um, this was our uh, end of the year party uh, back when we could actually uh, have parties. Uh, this was our end of the year party. Uh, this is what we do for fun in my lab. Um, so she had a blast and, and we, we measured her brain activity uh, first time. Um, and so you can see, uh, obviously, it's very safe and very comfortable um, and, and easily accessible. Uh, and then on the right here, this is. Uh, a little uh, Fragile X mouse. This is an FMR1 knockout mouse uh, with a implanted set of electrodes so that we can actually uh, measure his brain activity uh, in a similar way. So today I'm going to be talking about biomarkers um, and uh, you know there are a lot of different ways that you can have a biomarker. So um, what's the point of a neurophysiological biomarker, which is in this photo labeled as uh, brain imaging? Um, so neurodevelopmental disorders and behaviors can have a lot of underlying causes. Um, and they really represent a culmination of contributions from multiple genes and cellular functions. Um, so you can kind of see that here in the, um, you know, this upside down triangle, right? Our disease symptoms are really what we're sort of measuring diagnostically for a lot of these uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, but all of these genes and all of these cellular functions are potentially contributing to variability in these disease symptoms and the behaviors uh, that we measure. So brain-based biomarkers are a little further up the uh, pyramid here. They're a little closer to the subsets or even potentially individual cellular processes um, that, um, that contribute to specific measures. Um, or in the case of Fragile X syndrome, a single gene, right? We're, we're measuring it even just one gene and how it contrib uh, contributes to our neurophysiological markers. Um, so it may be well, more well suited to parse mechanistic explanations for the disorder, um, as well as serving as potentially a more stable treatment target than behaviors, which could have a lot of potential um, uh, kind of things going into uh, influencing them. And in our case, neural processes are also more easily conserved across species than, than specific behaviors. So why would we want to study biomarkers for autism spectrum disorders? Um, 
and related single gene disorders. Well, specific to autism, autism has a lot of variability. There's a lot of heterogeneity in autism. And so um, for research purposes, as well as for, um, you know, uh, clinical assessment and intervention purposes, it's important to look for homogenous subgroups in autism um, that we may be able to sort of better predict um, how they will respond to certain interventions, as well as better understand uh, specific biological pathways that might be contributing um, to their version of autism. Um, so that gives us a deeper understanding of pathophysiology. Um, we can potentially predict developmental trajectories. Um, and of course, uh, personalized medicine is, is always uh, in the back of our mind. I'm gonna be focusing on those third and fourth points today. So why should I study single gene disorders um, in context of autism? Um, well, the simple explanation is that they have a simpler genetic profile. So theoretically, we should have a greater understanding of the biology going on behind uh, their behaviors and symptoms. Um, but I, I give that a big maybe uh, because there's still a lot of heterogeneity and, and a lot of variability in uh, individuals with single gene disorders as well. Um, but one big bonus to single gene disorders is that we can make more straightforward animal models because we know we have a target gene to work with. Um, and so our animal models be, may be um, a little more um, easily translatable. Um, certainly single gene disorders that are associated with autism may serve as models of some of those um, homogenous subgroups of idiopathic autism. And of course, we just wanna help people who have single gene disorders as well. So I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about Fragile X syndrome, which is a single gene disorder that's associated with autism. Um, and specifically, it uh, results from a uh, trinucleotide repeat expansion in the SMR1 gene, which is located on the X chromosome. Um, and basically, once you get past 200 repeats, um, then the uh, DNA becomes uh, almost fully methylated to completely methylated. Um, in this area, and uh, essentially that means that even though you have a very large gene in that area, you actually have uh, no transcription um, and no translation of the associated fMR protein. Um, most individuals, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the general population, people without Fragile X syndrome, uh, typically you see, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 repeats of this gene. So this, or this, the um, trinucleotide repeat. So uh, 200 repeats is, is quite a, a large extension. Um, Fragile X syndrome is the most common known cause of inherited intellectual disability. Um, and uh, about half of Males with Fragile X syndrome will also meet diagnostic criteria for um, autism. So it's considered the most widespread single gene cause of autism. Um, and I do note here males because it is an X-linked disorder. And so um, uh, males only have one X chromosome, which means if we have a mutation in that one, um, that's all the protein they've got to work with. Whereas our females who have Fragile X syndrome tend to have um, a milder set of, of behaviors and, and milder um, uh, symptoms uh, because they have a backup, basically. Um, and that will come into play later. I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some gender differences in some of the, the data that we've collected as well. So of course, Fragile X syndrome um, can potentially give us insight into pathophysiology of uh, idiopathic autism. Um, uh, in some ways, but I will also present some potential different uh, data as well. Um, and Fragile X syndrome has a lot of translational research potential for treatment development. Um, the, as you will uh, see from my data, um, we've got some pretty strong candidate biomarkers and these do translate really nicely to the mouse model. And so there's a lot of potential options for um, trying new uh, interventions. I tend to focus on censoring processing in most of the neurodevelopmental disorders that I study um, for a number of reasons, both uh, you know, clinical and practical. Um, so uh, clinically speaking, sensory hypersensitivity is one of 
the most distressing and prevalent features um, in Fragile X syndrome, and it can be uh, a very distressing and, and prevalent feature in autism as well. Um, and there really aren't any very good therapeutic interventions for sensory hypersensitivity. Um, there are some in the literature, but they really report a lot of mixed success. Um, we also don't have really great measures for uh, measuring sensory processing abnormalities in, um, in anyone. Um, so we have the sensory profile, which is uh, either a caregiver or, or it can be a self-report um, and, and similar questionnaires, but um, those don't really separate sort of the um, basic experience of sensory processing versus the uh, behavioral response to it. They're really asking, you know, what do you do if you experience this, um, a, a sound, right? Do you cover your ears when you experience a sound? Well, that doesn't really tell us whether you actually hear the sound as louder, which is a basic physiology issue, or whether um, you are having trouble regulating your response to that sound. Um, we also, from a practical side of things, know a lot more about the basic physiology underlying sensory processing in the brain than we do some of the more um, sort of higher order cognitive and emotional processing uh, mechanisms. Um, and we have pretty good animal models for sensory processing, and it is much more well conserved across species than um, you know anything cognitive or, or certainly socially uh, related. So you know we've we've really found several promising biomarkers for fragile X pathophysiology, um, including redu uh, reduced cortical habituation to repeated sounds, um, increased theta and gamma power um, at rest, and increased gamma power and decreased synchrony during auditory processing. Um, and these biomarkers have largely replicated in a new sample and shown relation to a variety of clinical measures, which, uh, some of which I have over here. Um, we've also found that some of these biomarkers are present in autism as well. Um, and most importantly, they follow specific developmental trajectories. My colleagues have found that uh, these biomarkers translate almost perfectly in a number of ways to the FML1 knockout mouse. Um, they are also sensitive to genetic and pharmaceutical intervention, cortical in origin, and, uh, and we found specific links to circuit pathophysiology that, can, that we can then probe for mechanism. Um, and again, uh, the mouse shows developmental effects on these markers as well. Um, so it's really high time that we spend some time looking at developmental effects in the human. Um, most of the work that I have done previously has been in adults uh, with Fragile X syndrome. We really know a lot less about the developmental trajectories in uh, humans with Fragile X. We know uh, a fairly good amount uh, recently from mouse work about developmental trajectories in the mouse model. But Fragile X is a neurodevelopmental disorder, so we need to know how it um, changes over time and how it presents itself in um, its, its youngest individuals. Um, particularly because we've seen a lot of pharmaceutical trials uh, in adults with Fragile X. There have been a number of them. They show variable results. Ultimately, um, they've all failed at this point. Um, and so this is potentially pointing to a, a critical window of treatment opportunity. Um, maybe we're just not at the right age range. Maybe we need to be uh, working at intervening younger uh, before some of these, um, these sort of compensatory changes and, and other things have occurred. Um, most notably, a number of drugs, including uh, MGLUR5 antagonists and GABA agonists, have shown a lot of promising effects in the mouse, um, but they have ultimately failed in these adult trials. Um, and it may be because the adult brain has, over the many years, adapted to early neurodevelopmental changes. Um, so we may be seeing some compensatory effects that cause, cause these adult brains not to look the same as this more sort of, uh, quote unquote, pure model in, in the mouse, right? Um, and that may mean that an earlier window of treatment opportunity is necessary to treat sort of the primary biology um, before long-term compensatory changes occur. Um, so I'm a member of a large multi-site trial uh, investigating this idea by uh, testing a MGLUR antagonist uh, mavagluront 
in combination with the lang language learning intervention in children with fragile X, um, ages three to six, which is kind of a critical window for language development. Um, and EEG is, is one of the exploratory outcome measures in that trial. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're of course going to get a lot of really good information about development in that trial, but, you know, we also wanted to know a little bit more about development going into the trial as well. Um, so this study that I'm going to show you today was sort of thinking along those lines. Um, we're taking a developmental perspective, looking at um, individuals with fragile X, uh, the age range is four to 51 years. Um, and uh, comparing that to a similar age range in uh, typically developing controls. Um, this is a combination of a longitudinal study of children with fragile X um, that was funded by the Merck Foundation um, and one of adolescents and adults with fragile X from uh, CDC Component C. Um, and we were able to leverage the fact that we we're using identical experimental protocols from both uh, to examine both longitudinal and cross-sectional developmental effects on our EEG phenotypes. Um, so there's two things that they did in these tasks. They did resting EEG and then they did an auditory task um, called the auditory oddball. And uh, the oddball is similar to um, habituation tasks that I have um, mentioned in the past and, uh, and uh, similar to habituation findings that we've found in the past. Uh, but the habituation task that we use is actually too fast uh, for these young kids. Uh, their brains do not respond in the same way. But the on-ball task gets at sort of similar mechanisms um, for processing stimulus properties and stimulus expectancies um, with a slightly more cognitive component uh, in that the expectancies are not fixed. So there's variable timing for when this um, unusual or oddball stimulus comes up. Uh, basically what you see you have is um, a whole bunch of uh, beeps and they all sound exactly the same. Um, and then 10% of the time one of those beeps is, uh, is a higher pitch, so that's the oddball. Um, it's a really simple task. It requires no behavioral response, so it's appropriate uh, for individuals with intellectual disability. Um, and one of the things that you can get from it is something called the mismatch negativity, which I will uh, show you what that looks like in a little bit. But the mismatch negativity is essentially the difference in processing between uh, the sort of standard expected stimuli and this surprise stimulus. Um, and um, abnormalities and mismatch negativity have been found to be associated with language development and specific language impairment. And so um, this was a particular interest for us um, in our clinical trial uh, looking at a language learning intervention. Um, we also looked at sort of um, your classic sensory processing event related potentials. Um, and I'll get into what those look like uh, on the next slide. And uh, my pet project, Gamma Power, um, which I will be um, harping ceaselessly. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a walkthrough what a EEG data looks like in case you're not familiar with it. Um, so what we've got here are um, our ERP plots. So this is the event-related potential, um, which is averaged across the sensors highlighted in red on the top of this head right here. Um, and uh, what we see on the left here are the standard stimuli. So these are the common stimuli that they're hearing a lot. And then on the right is the oddball stimulus, um, which they are hearing um, only 10% of the time. Uh, so an event-related potential is an average of the neural time series data that occur in response to a specific stimulus, uh, which is denoted at time zero here on each plot. Um, and we examine differences in sort of the peaks and the troughs of uh, the waveform, um, which are associated with known sensory and cognitive functions. Uh, peaks are labeled P for positive going peaks and N for negative going peaks and numbered in the order in which they appear. So when I talk about the P1, that's uh, in the standards over here, that this is the P1. Um, that means it's the first positive peak. This is the N1, which is the first negative peak. Uh, typically developing controls are in black, fragile X is in red. Um, and basically what we expect to see in these plots is, uh, is that individuals modulate their neural responses based on stimulus expectancies. And you can already see sort of holistically that the shape of the waveforms differ between standards and on-ball stimulus. Uh, you can see this particularly well in the P2, which on standards is here. Uh, you guys can see my, my pointer, right? Okay, good. 
Uh, the standards are, are, this is the P2 here for standards. And then this is the P2 over here uh, for oddballs. And you can see that they look remarkably different to each other. Um, but mostly they look remarkably different in the typically developing controls. Um, Fragile X shows heightened P1 in one and P2 amplitudes relative to uh, typically developing. So you can see that they're larger on all of these peaks, uh, particularly for standard stimuli, which is, we've seen this before. This is consistent with the idea of hyper responsive sensory systems in Fragile X. Um, and you can see that Fragile X do not modulate the P1 amplitude to the oddball stimulus like um, typically developing individuals do. So what you can see here, if you look at the absolute um, amplitudes, and these are both on the same scale, amplitudes on the y-axis here, uh, you can see that Fragile X is about the same in amplitude uh, for the P1 across standards and oddball. But the controls are, are similar to Fragile X and the oddballs in that they are responding more strongly to these unusual stimuli and they're responding less strongly to uh, the common stimuli. Um, a repeated stimulus requires usually less neural resources to process than a novel one, and so this is, is what we would expect to see. Fragile X individuals, however, treat the stimulus basically as if it's new every time. Um, Typically developing controls all show, show a slowing of the P2 response. So you'll notice the latency here for the peak of the P2 is just before 200 milliseconds, and it shifted out here almost to 300 milliseconds uh, for the oddballs in um, our typically developing individuals. Fragile X individuals do not. They do reduce the P2, which is um, interesting, uh, but they don't show this sort of extended processing that we would expect to see. Um, but we do have a group by gender, by stimulus type interaction on this particular measure of uh, P2 slowing, which basically means that our females with Fragile X modulate a lot better than our males. They look a lot more uh, like our control population. We also looked at the mismatch negativity, um, which is calculated by subtracting the standard stimulus waveform from the oddball waveform. So the two waveforms that you just saw, we just subtracted one from the other and look at the difference waveform. Uh, the large negative peak in the difference waveform here represents the preferential processing for novel or unusual stimuli over repeated ones. Um, while the group differences look promising, it looks like our controls are doing this more uh, than Fragile X. Um, the group differences actually were not significant here. And we had a lot of variability in the mismatch negativity response in uh, actually both controls and, um, and our Fragile X group. So um, we also looked at gamma power and that's on the right here. And these are, I like to show these individual plots because um, I think it really gives you a good idea of the range we're working with and the variability that we're working with in the two groups. Um, so gamma power is the amplitude of the neural response in the 30 to 80 hertz frequency range. And we measure this over the entire window because it's basically the background brain activity that's going on here. It doesn't change overly much over the course of a presentation of a trial like the ERP does. Um, and we've consistently found increased gamma power um, in Fragile X across a variety of tasks. It's really stimulus invariant. Um, we found it in resting, we found it in this, we found it in previous work, um, and, and here was no different. Um, so gamma power is significantly higher in Fragile X, and there were no gender effects here. So our, our females with Fragile X are also showing increased gamma power. But you do see that there's a lot of overlap. Um, however, if you do take a look at sort of the, the majority of the groups, or a majority of the individuals in the controls, and then about half right, of our Fragile X individuals are um, coming in a little higher uh, than that. So we really see some that look just exactly like the majority of the controls and then some that do not. Um, and so this will be really important later. Um, I'll get into a little bit more detail. We're particularly interested in this gamma power phenotype um, because it is consistently found. Um, but it also arises from really basic neural circuit dynamics, more so than the ERP. 
Um, and these neural circuit dynamics are related to sort of excitation inhibition balance, um, the interplay between inhibitory um, interneurons and um, excitatory pyramidal cells. This really can be more closely linked to potential mechanisms for pathophysiology. Um, we're also interested in gamma power because in this sample, we found a completely normal developmental trajectory for gamma power in Fragile X uh, compared to our controls. They start out elevated, they remain elevated throughout development, um, which means that we could potentially use this measure in young children um, or extrapolate some of our more extensive adult findings to predict responses in children. Uh, the nice thing about uh, the Merck study with the children is that we have one month and actually one year follow up on these individuals. So um, this is actually a subset of 15 individuals that we have um, uh, one month follow up on. Um, we are only at six so far that have the one year follow up. So I'm not going to present that yet. Um, but you'll notice, uh, so these pictures are basically showing the, uh, the waveform that I showed you before, the ERP, and it is showing uh, uh, the black solid line is our baseline measure and the dotted line is at retest. And so what you can see right away is that we've got a lot of retest reliability. We had very high interclass correlations for the standards. Um, it's a little bit lower in the oddball stimuli the further out you get in the waveform because this is more um, cognitive processing, which does tend to have a more variable um, uh, latency. And we do have uh, fewer trials in the oddball. So just from a technical aspect, um, our measurements are not quite as reliable. Um, however, the P1, the N1, and gamma power show high retest reliability regardless of whether they're in standards or oddball stimuli. So they are robust to this reduced trial count. Um, and this is really important for use in repeated measures for clinical trials um, and also for considering the variables to use for, use for auditory paradigms. You know, maybe we don't want to focus on the mismatch negativity because retest reliability is lower in one of the stimuli that are going into that. Uh, maybe we really want to focus on this basic sensory processing or some of these phenotypes like gamma because they are robust to the lower trial counts that we're going to see um, in, in children who can only tolerate a certain amount of time of testing. Um, now we're going to get a little bit more into development here because we did have a nice uh, developmental group here, a nice range in age. Um, like with gamma, we saw largely normal developmental trajectories for most of the things that we measured in Fragile X, which was very interesting. They start, if, if they are abnormal in the group, they start off abnormal at a young age. Um, and that does include P2 latency slowing statistically, but I'm going to show you a picture um, in a minute that I think um, might potentially convince us otherwise. Um, adult males do show the clearest phenotype for some of these uh, these measures regardless though. So if we look at, this is actually the P2 latency slowing in the, uh, these now, uh, these dot plots, so you can see the variability. And on the right is uh, the entire sample. So you can see um, basically what we're looking at here is, is that anything on the, on the Y axis um, at zero or below indicates no slowing of the P2 response to novel stimuli. So this is just a, a, a millisecond subtraction between the two. Um, and if anything, if the further down we get that in, in uh, indicates speeding of the response. Um, and so we can see that um, almost every single typically developing individual um, has a positive value for this, which means that they are slowing that P2 latency uh, to the oddball stimulus. And the vast majority, we do see some individuals in the Fragile X group that have a normal amount of slowing here, uh, but then we see the vast majority are sitting right at zero, um, which means that basically they're not changing their latencies at all in response to changing uh, stimulus expectancies. Now, if we take a look at the graph here on the left, this is showing just adult males in both groups, and you can see that that splits them much more cleanly. Um, our, adult, our adult males are uh, the, show the most severe phenotype 
in, um, in the lack of P2 latency slowing and in fact can constitute most of the individuals that are speeding their response in response to the P2. Um, females, remember there was a gender interaction here. So females do tend to show a milder phenotype. Most of our females are the ones that are sitting up there in the um, um, overlap with our typically developing individuals. So we need to be thinking about development here because clearly there's something going on, uh, the difference between adults and children and that the adults are showing a much cleaner phenotype than the whole group. So if we look at the developmental results, so this is a little bit blurry, um, on the left here is uh, development. So this is um, age in years on a log scale. The gray dots and the gray line are um, fragile X and the black dots and black line are uh, typically developing, you can see that basically um, uh, they both follow the same developmental trajectory for our standard stimuli. But if you look over here at the oddball stimulus, this is where things start to um, be a little bit odder, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, so what you can see here basically is that um, with age, we see an increase in the amount of slowing to that oddball stimulus in our typically developing individuals. Um, but our fragile X individuals are kind of all over the place. And overall, you, you don't see any correlation with age. Um, they don't, you do not see a change um, relative to development. Um, and so basically what that means is that the further out in age you get, the more uh, discrimination you get between our two groups. So um, what does this mean as far as cognition and language? What does this mean for, um, for potentially our development and our developmental trial? Um, so these are partial correlations um, that are accounting for age because certainly we do see that age will affect these. Um, we know that these measures are linked to basic sensory and contextual updating processes, um, but how do they measure up to variability in clinical characteristics? Um, we have our expected sensory correlations here. So this is with the sensory profile. Um, and uh, we also see that P2 latency slowing, which is again important for processing information in context. So the P2 um, is really the first ERP peak, which is gonna show a major differentiation um, between our two stimuli. Like we'll, we'll see, we did see changes in all of our stimuli as far as amplitude, but the P2 is the one that really starts to change fundamentally between uh, uh, the stimulus expectancies. And so uh, P2 is, has um, a auditory cortex source, but it also has a frontal cortex source. So it is, it is a, basically a, uh, a top-down modulation of, uh, of auditory processing. So uh, what we see here, the P2 latency slowing is actually also correlated with um, cognitive ability, whereas gamma power is not. Um, we see here that gamma power is correlated with um, language ability, which is exciting because you know, we lost the mismatch negativity. So what can we think about that is gonna tell us a little bit about language? And it turns out that gamma power is one of those options. Um, in fact, the correlation with gamma power and the Vineland communication and uh, daily living subscales is a perfect replication of our previously published work from a different cohort. So that was pretty exciting to see. So what does this mean for clinical trials? Um, you know, P2 amplitude and latency modulation abnormalities in Fragile X suggest that there are de decreases in complex processing of novel stimuli. Um, this may lead to an abnormal response to common and unusual environmental stimuli. It may have, it may influence um, uh, uh, hypersensitivity and uh, being able to habituate to ongoing stimuli, all of these kinds of things. So we know that sensory processing is reliably different, right? Um, we've seen these increased amplitudes of ERPs um, now, we've seen them in the past. Um, we've seen the increased gamma power now and in the past. Um, and so these are probably one of the more straightforwardly translatable measures for animal models because they are very basic in origin and um, they are gonna be the most easily um, replicable in our mouse models. 
Um, this context updating is getting a little more cognitive with the P2 latency, and so this you know, may or may not translate as well to our mouse model. Um, but we do see um, here that we, um, we should potentially be thinking about this mostly in adult males. Um, and we do see some IQ and cognitive correlations there. And so in basically our, our most severely um, affected individuals. And uh, while group differences are more prominent in adults, most of our development developmental trajectories for this measure were um, very similar to uh, typically developing controls. So that really gives us the opportunity to predict things in younger children. Um, but we need to be sure that we're always considering development because those developmental differences that we did see for things like the P2 may actually explain that effect. Retest reliability is strong. Um, which is important for clinical trials. And importantly, it's strong in young children as well. So um, that's going to be very important moving forward with um, younger children in trials. I also wanna make the case for gamma power before I make the case against anything. I want to make the case for gamma power. Um, so gamma power is reliably increased in Fragile X. Um, it's, it's likely stimulus invariant, invariant, so we see this increased gamma power in basically everything that we do uh, with Fragile X, um, and it follows the predictable developmental trajectory. We've seen it in our mouse models, and it also is um, responsive to pharmaceutical manipulation, so um, that is a, uh, a beacon of hope there. We do have some probable links to um, Fragile X pathophysiology at the slice level in mouse. Um, and we've seen uh, pretty consistent links to sensory processing and language development in the human. Um, importantly, we see because it seems to be stimulus invariant, uh, the test retest reliability is good even in, uh, in the reduced trial counts with, uh, with fewer stimuli. So it might be possible to utilize this more stable gamma power measure as a proxy for some of the processes that are underlying things like the mismatch negativity. Um, so gamma band connectivity um, between temporal and frontal cortices has been associated with mismatch negativity and response to novel stimuli, um, which is suggesting a role for gamma in processing or um, auditory context outside of sensory cortices alone. Um, it's been linked to language processing, language development, and, uh, and item prediction in language comprehension. Um, and we also have putative mechanisms for altered gamma power in Fragile X. So some of this, um, this slice work has uh, shown us that it's uh, mainly reduced excitatory drive onto inhibitory interneurons. Um, and increased rigidity of layer-specific oscillatory behavior that is contributing to this increase in gamma power. So gamma power measure, measures may, not, uh, may be useful not just for evaluation of sensory phenotypes, but as an index of more general cortical function in Fragile X. Um, running out of time, so I will very quickly get to the end here. Does this generalize though? Can we, you know, we've told you all about Fragile X, does this generalize to other neurodevelopmental disorders? And the answer is yes and no. Um, so, uh, you know, it, we examined uh, a gamma power in, in autism. We've done this a number of times, and we do fairly consistently find increased gamma power in autism as well. But when you start looking at it from a developmental perspective, things get a little more iffy. Um, so here, this is gamma power in, um, in individuals with autism and typically developing individuals off um, over a, a sort of younger developmental range. Um, the right here is, uh, is gamma power uh, labeled STP. And then on the left, it's something I didn't really talk about too much in this talk. This is um, gamma phase locking. Um, this is basically the uh, ability of the brain to produce the same signal reliably in time over a lot of trials. Um, both autism and Fragile X individuals show deficits in this measure um, in the gamma frequency range. So black shapes are, are autism and uh, white shapes are typically developing. Um, and what you'll notice here is that gamma power tends to decrease slightly 
for our typically developing individuals, whereas it uh, really doesn't do much at all for autism over this uh, age range. Um, and then in, uh, in our uh, typically developing individuals, phase locking ability, um, the sort of reliability of the measure goes up with age, and if anything decreases slightly uh, for individuals with autism. So in both cases, um, gamma power and phase locking are very similar in autism to um, typically developing in children. So you see a lot of overlap in children, um, but in both cases, individuals with autism fail to follow the same developmental trajectory, which leads to larger group differences on these measures once they become adults. Um, so perhaps the similar findings for Fragile X and autism adults from, regarding gamma deficits re kind of result from two different pathways. Um, one which is already abnormal at a young age in Fragile X and continues to maintain that trajectory throughout development um, uh, versus one that becomes abnormal over the course of adolescent development um, and so potentially may have a mechanism associated in adolescent neural pruning. If we contrast that with our findings in Phelan McDermott syndrome, um, which is another rare genetic disorder associated with autism, um, where we found um, that neural power over most frequencies is actually more similar to typically developing in adults than in children, so that's the opposite. Um, Phelan McDermott syndrome individuals start out with very low power and they stay that way. Uh, whereas our typically developing individuals start out with higher power and decrease over age to the point where they are um, at similar values to Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, so it's basically the opposite of what we're seeing here in autism, but both of them are due to a similar flattening of the developmental curve for power. It's just where they start out that is defining where we actually see group differences most reliably. So it's clear that we need larger samples in younger ages to be certain of our developmental effects, right? Where do we want to go next? We've got to look at, we've got to focus entirely on, on how this works um, in, in much larger samples so that we get a very, very clear picture of development, um, particularly in our younger ages. Um, and some of that's going to come from the baseline and retest data in the Neuronext clinical trial of Mavaglorant that I mentioned earlier. Um, but some of that will hopefully come um, from uh, planned developmental studies, uh, longitudinal developmental studies, uh, working with my colleagues um, in the next couple of years. Um, we also need to think about practical aspects like data driven analyses versus set measures for clinical trials um, and, and links to clinical measures. Um, so how do we set up these a priori standards and link them to clinical findings reliably? Um, and then the rest of these steps go together um, in that we have a lot of variability in our data, both within and across neurodevelopmental groups. Um, recall that gamma power overlap, um, but there were potential subgroups in Fragile X, right? There was a group that looked a lot like controls, and then there was a group that was higher. Um, we find this increased gamma in Fragile X over and over again. It has high retest reliability, but, but really what causes it? Um, and why do some people with Fragile X so show relatively typical gamma power if it's indexing something fundamental about Fragile X? Um, it may be that gamma is indexing specific functional ability or impairments in Fragile X related to sensory processing, um, which we actually hypothesize based on this and other findings may become prioritized, so to speak, um, in the developing brain in Fragile X. Um, so sensory pro processing really gets um, uh, it, it's really pushed to the forefront in uh, attempting to sort of normalize it uh, by the, the developing brain. Um, and that may come at the expense of cognitive processing and may then make it related to more general disability and fragile X. Um, but there's a lot that still needs to be done to make this camera ready. Um, in particular, separating out clinical characterization of those with high gamma, parsing potential confounds, as well as determining whether the developmental trajectory of gamma uh, which does change in, in typical development, means that gamma power is a better index of cortical fun function in some age ranges over others. Uh, certainly seems to be more so the case for autism and Phelan-McDermott syndrome than Fragile X, uh, but we need larger sample sizes to be sure.
So in conclusion, we've come up with some pretty simple EEG measures for auditory stimuli that may serve as reliable indicators of function in Fragile X. Um, at least in Fragile X, we see similar developmental trajectories. Um, and so we may be able to use some of our existing data to predict patterns of deficit in younger ages um, and, and sort of to guide our next developmental studies in young children. Uh, retest reliability is strong for these, so I think they, they are a potentially really good candidate for clinical outcome measures, particularly gamma power, uh, but not yet, right? We're still working. Uh, there's still a lot that needs to be done to validate that, and I hope, um, you know, I hope in the next couple of years we'll see some, some work from my group and from others that will, will hopefully lead in this direction. All right, so that's if you are interested in any of our um, work and some others that uh, go into this process, I have some references that you can uh, examine. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Um, this, is a, this is about half of my lab from about three years ago because they're like herding cats to try to get a picture. Uh, but there are a few individuals in here I wanna highlight. Um, so, uh, uh, this is Lisa, who recently uh, got her PhD and is uh, now going on to be a postdoc at uh, Cincinnati Children's in the Fragile X Center. Um, and she is, has been um, absolutely, uh, uh, we will miss her greatly because she has contributed incredibly to all of this work. Um, Jordan also has contributed over many years as an undergraduate and now as a new graduate student in the lab. Um, and, uh, and Kara as an undergraduate who is actually now at, um, at University of Washington in clinical psychology PhD program, but as an undergraduate, she uh, contributed a great deal to this. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry I went over by a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> I would be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, great talk. If uh, we were in person, I think there'd be a lot of clapping right now. So <laughs> thanks for doing it. Um, so uh, real quick, I think that if people are sending questions via chat, I think they're going to go to you directly and, I, and okay. I'll try to answer oral questions mm -hmm. and chat questions. So I don't know if Shannon, you can reclaim hosting duties so that you can maybe help Lauren filter through questions. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't see that, any so here. Knowing it's possible. Yeah, I actually am still the host and, um, okay. haven't received any questions via okay. the chat. So I do want to open it up to questions, but before I do that, um, I'm going to ask my own question if I could selfishly step in. Um, okay. So in the beginning uh, of your talk, you, you presented um, the, you described briefly the um, reality that multiple trials in Fragile X syndrome um, unfortunately failed. Um, yeah. were, 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 there was some optimism before those trials began, but then there was also some discouragement um, after those trials moved forward. Um, one of the concerns that you address clearly and which was really important is, is the, um, the ability of the outcome measures to be quantitative and sensitive in nature um, to target engagement as well as um, real treatment effects, um, but also the fact that it they were adult studied mm -hmm. um, uh, primarily and, and that was a concern. Um, your data, if I'm understanding correctly, some of the data um, suggests that the differentiation isn't going to be real evident, say in the P2 latency, if I recall correctly, for the oddballs um, until maybe later childhood, adolescence, or, or adulthood, and the adults yeah. were um, the ones who were most severely or robustly affected. Mm -hmm. um, how are you thinking about that and these measures being translated into trials that potentially would focus on earlier points in development when the brain may be more um, uh, amenable to, to, to interventions and, and trajectories may be more readily altered in theory at least? Yeah, I mean, I think that means that, um, that you know, the P2 is probably, you know, it's, it's an interesting finding but it's probably something that is going to be relegated to adult studies um, if we want to look at, at treatment effects in that response. Um, you know, it's, it's really exciting in that it's associated with, with cognitive function. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I really try to make my case for gamma because I think that that's one 
that is going to be more reliably useful in, um, in our kids. Um, and especially because gamma power, you know, we found it here in this, um, this study, which this, the stimulus itself only takes about five minutes. So really the kids can do it um, for the most part, um, but resting data we can get in even shorter amounts of time. And we also see elevated gamma at rest. Um, and so I didn't present the resting data here um, because we're still working on it, but we are seeing elevated gamma as well at rest. And um, you know, I think that that may be something that we can really focus on as being a very, very sort of quick, kind of even like a black box measure, right? We can get, we can get a couple minutes of EEG and we can um, very quickly process that. Um, EEG or uh, gamma power is also robust to a number of artifacts, but it is sensitive it, uh, to muscle artifacts. So we have to be careful about that. Um, and that's one of the things that we have to validate moving forward is, um, you know, we do have the potential compound that our individuals with Fragile X are going to be, um, for the most part, less compliant with the EEG and more likely to be moving around. And so we do a lot to remove muscle activity from the data. Um, we do a, I mean, it's, it's the number one thing we focus on in my lab for every project because it is such an extensive process. Um, but I think we need better ways to do it, right? I think, you know, we're still not perfect in that we can be absolutely sure that we've separated signal from noise um, and be absolutely certain that this is, is fully cortical in origin. Now we do have mouse data that supports that it is. So, um, you know, the, the fun part about the mouse is that you can collect the EEG data and they can walk around on a little horse plate and it will tell you when they're moving and when they're wiggling their whiskers and everything. Um, and so we can actually compare gamma power in our knockout mice when they are moving around versus when they're completely still. And we do still see the elevated gamma in the completely still mice. So I am fully convinced it is a true thing. It's just that we need to um, we need to make it more perfect before it, it becomes a true outcome measure that we can use reliably. That makes sense. It's um, the the translational capacity for these measures is is frankly one of the most exciting components to it. And so the fact that you're seeing the same similar types of patterns in, in mice is really uh, yeah, and the nice thing is we can investigate a lot of these things in the mice. Um, so, you know, if we saw that completely go away in the mouse, I think we would not be, we would kind of have to, you know, <laughs> start from scratch. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, I think that's really, really nice. And then we also, of course, can, can test a lot of no novel drugs in the mouse. Um, once we find that phenotype we really want to focus on. So we are approaching time, but I want to make sure that others do get a chance, I mean, to monopolize, to get their question, questions in. I thought I saw, uh, yes, Zora, you had the quickest hand to unmute yourself. So Zora, why don't you go ahead and, okay. and ask away. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, great talk. I have a quick question. Is there any information about the prevalence of sensory hearing loss in this population with Fragile X? Because uh, as you know, sometimes it depends on the range of it, like a high pitch or low pitch hearing loss, uh, sensory hearing loss, which could have different meaning and different underlying occult mechanism. And um, I wonder if there's any, anyone has to look into that. I'm sorry, can you, you're, you're very quiet. Can you oh, okay. repeat the first part? I'm sorry. Let's you don't hear that. I, I don't like these heads. So oh, uh, my question was that, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. I was wondering if there is any information known about the prevalence of sensory hearing loss in this population of fragile X, because particularly, uh, because as you know, depending on the um, uh, type of hearing loss, I mean, sensory hearing loss, if it is high pitch or a low pitch, basically frequencies, it could have different outcome and different meaning. So I wonder if um, such a study has been done so um, everyone that we have in our trials does not have any um, medical history of hearing loss. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, um, with some of our intellectually 
impaired individuals to do um, a typical hearing screening. You can do um, auditory brainstem response, uh, but there is debate about whether that is also abnormal in Fragile X uh, because FMRP is, is also missing from the brainstem. Um, so, you know, we certainly do screen for, for you know, sort of the um, just base hearing loss. Um, at this point, though, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done to, to evaluate that. You're right. We need to make sure that what they're hearing from the outside is actually similar um, to, um, you know, what they're, what they're, what's coming in and getting to the cortex before it's even processed needs to be accurate. Um, and this, also, I'm sorry, I, mean, I wanted do, to do, also uh, add that, I'm sorry, I wanted to also add that uh, because I did um, ages ago, my uh, undergrad work actually was on hearing loss. Uh, I don't work on that area anymore, but it catch my attention because there are a lot of, um, uh, of course, heterogeneity in that uh, uh, space too. But it, on the other hand, uh, you have such a nice and rich um, data that I think it may hopefully maybe add a little bit more to the picture and filling some of the gaps, particularly uh, sometimes could be a minor changes between left and right ear mm -hmm. as far as processing because it's not uniform. It could be unilateral and it may then adding that and overlaying that to the information, to the aging information that you have, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, it may help with again filling some of the gaps. Yeah, I definitely, I agree. I, um, I'm actually, I'm uh, recently got in contact with uh, a new Fragile X, well, she's not new, but she's new to me, a uh, Fragile X researcher who um, is interested in sort of the peripheral aspects of, of auditory function in Fragile X. And so we're, we're hoping to combine forces to address that. And certainly in the mouse, um, that's something you have to be aware of because the, um, uh, one of the strains of mice actually has a hearing loss um, associated with it as it gets older. And so we have to be careful to, um, only measure those mice before they are experiencing those things. Um, but at least the, the mice with no known issues with external um, apparatus um, appear to replicate the phenotype. And so um, I think that it's probably, it's certainly something we need to know as far as how it um, influences variability in our measures. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily causative in this case. Thanks so much, Zora, and, and thank you, Lauren. I know we're a little bit over time. Lauren, if you have just a couple more minutes, I just want to determine whether anybody else had, um, we could probably do one more question if anybody else has a question that they were dying to ask. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Can, can um, we take one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, there's a question about, uh, from Walker, about um, whether there's any evidence for similar mechanisms contributing to sensory sensitivities in other domains. Um, so for example, in autism, um, we often see um, tactile oversensitivity, like in clothing and things like that. So do you know if there's any um, research on other sensory domains? So um, yes, well, yes and no, in that uh, certainly there's some mouse work on tactile processing that shows that it is also hypersensitive in the um, FMR1 knockout. Um, and we're actually, uh, this, this project actually incorporates a tactile component. We did the auditory, we ran the auditory first. We haven't actually started the tactile component uh, due to some technical difficulties, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we're, that's sort of my next step. I want to see how this translates across sensory modalities. I mean, we ultimately, I, I actually commonly include a slide as to why I chose auditory. Um, it's one of the most um, profoundly affected and most common hypersensitive modalities in uh, fragile X and autism. Um, and it is one of the most well conserved across species as well. Um, but tactile is right behind that. And so I'm uh, definitely interested in that's going to be the next modality we, we look at for sure. Um, but there's definitely, there's been a lot of work in barrel cortex and mouse that shows um, similar abnormalities. So I think that it is indexing a more general cortical function measure um, that it may even go beyond sensory processing. Um, some of these sort of basic circuit properties that we're looking at. Yeah. 
Thanks so much, Lauren. And thanks everyone for staying on. But Lauren, thanks for a wonderful talk, um, for spending time with us. Um, and, um, and please everyone, Lauren, you as well are invited uh, to join us for our next seminar. Um, Dr. Olivia Beach will be speaking on October 1st. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. But um, thank you again. And thank you for staying a few extra minutes, Lauren. Um, thanks everyone for staying on. Take care. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.